I'll start recording. Awesome. And I see Amy. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just read it in myself. I'm not Zoom tree for obvious reasons. Good evening, Amy. It's just you for now, but we are expecting more people to, to join within the next couple of minutes. And for folks who are watching a recording of this later this week or whenever, just letting you know, this is our monthly DC Solar Action Team meeting. So if that's what you're here for, you're in the right place. So just stay tuned. We're just waiting for more folks to join us. And Alexis, if you haven't already, can you just uh, drop the link to the agenda real quick? Awesome. That's weird. I'm guessing this is going to be a small audience today because um, I don't know. Let's just give it one more minute and I'll get started. And because it's being recorded, you know, people can access this later. So not a problem. I did have two people email me that said they would watch the recording, but they weren't able to come today of our regular comers. Gotcha. So I'm going to speak during this presentation with the assumption that the majority of the people who are watching this or who are attending this are attending it after the events passed. So that's how I'm going to be taking on this. Okay, I, you know, I do expect more people to hop in once in a while, but let's just get started. Um, good evening, everyone, folks who are in the room and who are watching this, uh, watching a recording. Welcome again to our monthly Solar Action Team meeting for DC. My name is Sukrit Mishra. I am the program director in the region, and I also support our co-op programs in Maryland and Virginia. And uh, yeah, welcome aboard. And let's just do a quick round of introductions. Um, I do have Alexis over here who, and I'll just let you introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's Alexis Miller and I'm the Director of Community Impact at Solar United Neighbors. And then also cover this region with SCRI um, over our engagement efforts. So volunteers and events that we run. And I'm excited to see folks here tonight and continue to build the solar movement in DC. Uh, Amy, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Amy Hubbard, uh, live in southeast edge of Capitol Hill and just, you know, attending meetings and trying to help out where I can. And I think we also have Dr. Sadler on board. Um, if you want to give a quick introduction or what you're looking for. Thank you. Zara Sadler, ICSC residency programs. We're in Ward 4. Awesome. Community awesome. Solar. Thank you. Um, Thank you for everyone for being here. As you can see, it is a small crowd, but um, yeah, uh, the agenda is in the chat. There are two major talking points today, just following up from the meeting last month. Um, number one, I will just go over the co-op results real quick. The objective, objectives we had, have we achieved them, and what the plan is now that the co-op is closed and how we plan to run it next year. And number two, um, it's to do with the hearing that we have on October 3rd, which uh, is focused around expanding um, expanding the ACPs or keeping them capped at 500 bucks per megawatt hour, and also expanding the solar carve out from 10 to 15% by the year 2041. And um, I will do a mini economics present, I mean, not presentation, but, um, chat on that and explain why it's so important. So to get us to get started, let me just go over the co-op numbers real quick. And for folks who are watching a recording of this, um, just a quick introduction on what the co-ops are all about. You know, folks always have the option of going solar on their own, but since our inception as an organization, we run these co-ops in each of the 12 states and Puerto Rico across the nation. And the purpose of the co-ops is to attain 
a bulk purchase price for the folks who are qualified for the co-op, which means they get a discount on their installation rates with the, install with the installer who is participating in the program. So that's the one big benefit of the co-op. The second one is solar is still fairly new. You know, we don't expect everyone to be an expert in this field. This is my daytime job, but I don't expect the same of everyone else who's residing in DC and beyond. And, you know, the benefit of the co-op is anytime you have any questions for the installer during the installation process, or even beyond that, if you run into some issues, that's the benefit. We are basically the intermediary. We'll connect you with the installer to fix those issues. If we can't, we'll connect you with the third party and do our best over there. So, you know, that was just a quick context on why we do the co-ops. And in DC, we have been running the co-ops since 2014. Uh, we did pause during the pandemic, but we restarted our annual co-op in DC last year. Um, last year was the first edition of the Capital Area Co-op. What that means is we kind of bulked up three co-ops in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Each of them were independent one of one another, but they were running by the uh, running in the concurrently on the same timeline in terms of selecting the installer, signing the contracts, proposals, and all that other stuff which is why we called it the Capital Area Co-op. We did a trial run last year in DC and uh, that co-op had four bids from four different installers and Edge Energy was eventually selected. And it was a fairly good first rendition of that co-op. We eventually had 49 people who signed contracts in that co-op and all in all, I think we had 120 or 125 participants. We wanted to build on it for obvious reasons this year. We had same targets. We were hoping for around 45 to 50 signed contracts. And we opened that co-op in April this year. We had, I believe four bids and Solar Solution won the bid to serve the co-op. And uh, as of, I believe, as of Thursday or today, uh, after uh, 12 p.m. today, um, I believe we had 74 signed contracts in that program. As of today, we have another 18 people who are sitting on proposals and I'm just trying to help them go through the numbers and, you know, fingers crossed, we can get some of some more people through the finish line. But we have more than crossed our expectations for that program, more than 50 contracts. I was hoping 110, 120 members to sign up. We have 165 members on the, in that program, which is amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been good for the most part. And uh, we are expecting to do another edition of this co-op in March or April next year. This co-op is close to new participants as of August 31st. So we will be doing another edition in March or April next year. If you're interested in that co-op, um, I will be sending that link later. I mean, in the follow-up email tomorrow, but you can always visit our website as well. And uh, yeah, just stay tuned for more updates. If you know family or friends who want to join our co-ops, that's, that's a perfect avenue next year. But if that timeline doesn't work for you, you can always reach out to us. We'll connect you with installers outside the program and still make something work for you. At the end of the day, my job is to make your solar journey as easy as possible, whether it's inside the co-op ideally, but out or outside, it doesn't matter. It's a win-win for everyone. So that was a co-op update. Any, let's see, still two people. Any questions? Amy or Dr. Sadler, we good? That's that was a smaller question. update. How do sure. the co-ops uh, facilitate homeowners and the SREC, uh, claiming SREC and just the, right. the process? Sure, sure. So at least in the DMV co-ops, how it works is, first of all, we are a neutral nonprofit. So we don't vouch for any SREC brokers. We don't take any sides. We maintain a neutral stance. Having said that, any member who goes solar in the co-op um, they qualify for a 50% discount should they sign a contract with Soul Systems, which is one of the major brokers in the region. SREC Trade is another one. I believe, I believe Fleet is another one in Maryland and beyond, but we do not work with them. We just have an agreement with Soul Systems. So how it works is assuming folks who sign a contract and have a system installed do want to go with Soul System, they can reach out to them. Soul System support staff reaches out to us, which is me in this case, just to verify their participation in the co-op. Once I confirm that, they can sign any contract that they want and they get a 50% discount on their broker fees. 
that's the benefit with sold systems. If they go with S3 Create, however, they can work independently with them. But if they have any questions about any contracts, because these brokers have three or four different SREC options. One is a market rate, one's a three-year contract, which is playing it safe. If you want to be really, really safe and lock in below market prices for say five years and lock, lock that in, you can do that as well. But if you have questions, questions about those SRECs or the potential revenues, you can send them our way and I'll be happy to review it, which I always do for folks who are outside the co-ops. So just depends on your affiliation with the co-op, within or without, without the co-ops, you can qualify for those, for those benefits. Um, okay, does that thanks. answer the question? Yeah, yeah, of course. And if you have any follow-up questions, as always, DC team at solarunitedneighbors.org. I moderate that inbox every day. And of course, there's also the DC listserv. Again, I mean, I'm still learning my trade as a part of the organization, but if I can answer the questions, I will always do my best to connect you with a third party or a policy expert who is more well-versed on that stuff. Okay, so that was the first update. Thanks. And number two, the bigger update and the reason why we convened over here has to do with the solar um, expansion amendment or that bill that's gonna be discussed on October 3rd. And it's officially known as the Local Solar Expand Expansion Amendment Act of 2022. And I'm trying to look for the official name. I, I did have it here, but I'm missing it for some reason. No worries, but um, just to provide some context on this, one of the big benefits of going solar in the DMV or specifically DC is not just the fact that it offsets your electricity bills, but number two, as you probably know, the ESRIC market is really, really lucrative. And there's no, you know, close runner up to this across the country. That's one of the ben big benefits of going solar, SREX and net metering. And as the law stands right now, um, I believe the solar carve out is, they're trying to hit 10% by the year 2041. And the SECP or alternative compliance payments are at 500 this year per megawatt hour going down to $400 in 2024, and then to $300 in 2029. And that was always the plan until um, the council members decided to propose this amendment, which basically increases the car route to 15% by 2041. Number two, it keeps the alternative compliance payments or ACPs locked at 500 bucks a megawatt hour or that's also, you can also call it 50 cents per kilowatt hour till 2041. Both these proponents are good. And let me just explain why. Um, not just for folks on this call, but anyone watching this recording, because there's a reason why this is being proposed and why there are a lot of solar advocates watching for this. Um, so let's, how do we do this? So for solar, um, how the whole mechanism for SRECs or renewable energy credits works is it's a production incentive. Once you go solar, install the system on your rooftop for, for every megawatt hour that you produce in clean energy, you receive a virtual credit. And then you can go to an SREC broker, sign a contract, and that's a separate revenue stream from whatever you're offsetting on your electricity bills. And that's what makes this whole market so lucrative. Now that SREC market, it has two determinants. Number one is the ACP or alternative compliance payments. This is basically the alternative payment that utility providers have to, have to pay up every year for every megawatt hour for, or for every unit that they fall short of those solar energy goals. As I said, the solar carve out, that's actually the minimum requirement that PEPCO has to produce in clean energy every year. So for example, this year in 2022, their clean energy carve out or solar carve out this year is 2.6%. 2.6% of their energy that they're supplying in the district has to clean, come from clean energy sources. If they cannot meet it, then for every unit that they fall short, they either pay the ACP, which is 500 bucks, or they buy up SREX from folks who are producing SREX on their rooftop and they can pay, pay in that form. Now, SREX will always be below the ACP for obvious reasons, because it cannot top that, just for the utility's sake and for, for, for folks who actually have SREX. Um, in recent months, as you probably saw, 
at its peak, the asset market in DC was around $380, $390. I remember when I first joined the solar industry during the pandemic, it was around $410, simply because the market was so lucrative and you know, we were just getting started. In recent months, it's um, bottomed down to around 280 or 290 bucks. I checked it earlier this evening. It was in the open market on Soul Systems website, it was at around $310 which is, you know, that's fairly reasonable, but in order to ensure that the SREX do not, or those weights do not drop any further, this is one of the proponents. By locking in the ACP at 500, utilities will be always pushed to continue to pursue clean energy and purchase any potential SREX that they fall short by. And this is an incentive for homeowners to go solar simply because, you know, the SREX market is so lucrative. And number two, we can also reach our clean energy goals within that target year of 2041. Number two is the carve out. I had a lot of customers reach out and you know they asked, why did the ESRIC rates drop out all of a sudden? Is it wise to sell my ESRICs right now? Should I wait for a couple of months? Is, am I in risk of losing more money if the ESRIC rates drop down even further? And our default position was, you know, we are not fortune tellers, we are not economic experts, but we're expecting it to remain the same, but it's also a supply and demand mechanism right there. You know, um, if, there is, if there is a shortage of demand of SREX and there's an excess supply, obviously their prices will bottom out or drop or abate in the short run. And that's what's happened this year. What ha what's happened is at least this year, the carve out for solar was 2.6%. What that means is 2.6% of the utilities energy has to come from solar sources, it's already hit that target, so there's no incentive to purchase more clean energy, which is why those prices usually bottom out or drop towards the end of the year. Next year, looking through the chart, the uh, carve out is going up to 2.85%, so those rates will go up again. But instead of having this volatility, this amendment ensures that these prices stay locked in. We are increasing the carve out, which ensures that the ESRIC rates won't be as volatile. And that's where we need your help. So what I'll be doing is I will be testifying in favor of this bill on October 3rd. Leave it at noon and you can testify virtually. And I'm still prepping my notes and trying to make a case as to why our organization and our stakeholders can vouch for this bill. But also, you know, we do need people or homeowners who have gone solar who can also vouch for this bill. And what we have done to that extent is we have issued an action alert earlier today to everyone who was signed up for our listserv and other platforms. Number two, anyone who went solar with us, they, sh they should have received an alert about this. Just asking them to, you know, testify in favor of this bill, which is on October 3rd. And, you know, there's still time. So if you have questions about how the, pro how the process works, you can reach out to us via email. We can also send you our notes in terms of what we are proposing. And, you know, you can, you can call copy of that it's it's not a big deal but you know having said all this this is my first time testifying um, on this level and from what i understand you're given three minutes you speak in favor or against the bill or the amendment and uh, once your three minutes are up that's it you're done so that's what you're asking from folks in dc because we want people to we want this growth to be organic and for people outside organizations or businesses to watch for this and another big thing that I forgot was, you know, in our co-ops, solar is a bit more discounted, but there's still low to moderate income communities and some boards here in DC, who's, you know, where solar is still out of their reach. And that's where the solar for all program kicks in, where they're getting the benefits of solar at even lower rates upfront. And that's only possible for DOE to provide because of these alternative compliance payments and these SREC revenues. That's what's actually funding that program. So by locking in these rates or actually amend, amending this, this act to make it more lucrative by 2041, it's beneficial for LMI communities. It's beneficial for other homeowners looking to go solar. And it, as the solar movement gro grows more steam and we attain more economies of scale, it's gonna be more price competitive. It's gonna compel more utility providers to invest more in this. So that's another reason we are vouching for this amendment. That was a, where is my Zoom? That was a mouthful. So, you know, 
take some time to process this. If you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer it here. But if I can't, I will defer to Liz Weezy, who is our policy director, and she'll get back to you sometime next week. She's out on a convention on the West Coast. So, you know, I'm all ears. Um, if you guys have any questions or if you need any clarifications, fire away. I, I do have a question. Um, sure. Is, so, um, what is it you want homeownership say, saying? I mean, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't know things on the same level that you do, Sukrit, and also mm -hmm. you wouldn't want me to just repeat the same technical stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But are there specific approaches you want people to take on this testimony, or do you have yeah, thoughts on I mean, that? sure, sure. I mean, we did brainstorm this internally, and like there are two chains of thought here. For folks who participated in our SFA or Solar for All program, which was mm -hmm. excludes excludes up to LMI communities back in 2019. For them, it's a more it's more of a matter of energy burden, reducing the load on their energy bills. They benefited from those insulations. So to ensure that more folks benefit from this, their line of thought is don't don't stop that movement for them. And the only way to sustain those revenues or to keep the solar for all movement going or to get keep that program going is to ensure they have enough revenues from the ACPs or the alternative compliance payments which is only possible by this amendment, by ensuring we have a conductive market for solar in DC. Mm -hmm. For other folks who, you know, they have more disposable income, it's simply about ensuring that we have gotten our benefits from this, from solar in the district. Let's just keep it going. Let's ensure mm -hmm. that that SREC market remains competitive nationally, remains mm -hmm. propped up. And in order to do that, we need to reduce that volatility, volatility and lock in these ACPs at 500 bucks for the next two decades. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, 20, 20 years is a long time. A lot of things change by then, but by securing this, we're gonna be well on our way to achieve that solar carve out and go even mm -hmm. beyond that. So those are the two trains of thought. So I, I remember uh, in a previous meeting, Anya alluding to, not alluding, saying that there will be pressure to not pass this. Do you know what kinds of arguments are gonna come in opposition to it? Um, good question. I look, I, I'm not gonna be naive and just say that it's gonna it's gonna pass in its current form. It's really yeah. bold. I mean, we mm -hmm. are essentially what going up by 50% on our existing goals if this wasn't already good enough. So I'm expecting pushback on this from folks who are more invested in other sources of fuel or who are resistant to this change, which is okay. But in a, we are in favor in its current form. I do not know what their argument or the li their lines of argument will be, but let me check in with Liz and get back to you on this because I did yeah. I don't want to say something for the sake of it without being technically correct here. But okay, I can anticipate, but I don't want to say it on record simply because yeah. you know we are being recorded here. So let me get back yes. to you on that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just trying trying to get a sense. To, as we're sitting here talking about this, I'm thinking about for me. You know, there's a lot of urgency around these terrible storms that we've been having and hotter summers and the flooding. And, um, you know, as a homeowner, I can talk about the benefits I've had as well and how um, I want other people to be encouraged to do this. So, um, OK, thanks. Appreciate that. No, absolutely. And Amy, I agree on your last point. You know, like I said, we work in 12 states, so I do host pro bono 15 minute calls and consultations even outside D.C. And there are two types of people and I'm not blaming anyone here, you know, um, solar is still pricey. It's still getting, it, it has dropped by 70% in terms of costs in the last 10 years, but it's, it's still a pricey investment. So when I talk to people and let's say more where people really want to, I'm not going to use political terms here, but where people are looking at climate change or really want to make a difference, they don't care about the returns or the asterisks and all that other good stuff for them. It's more about, look, how many, how much of my, Consum consumption am I offsetting? What are the benefits? Versus someone else who says, well, it's so pricey. Are the ITCs good enough? What's my payback period? Which is fine. I mean, it is it is a pricey investment. I want to make sure you're actually getting your you know investment or your returns after the after you hit break even. So, you know, it just depends on who you speak to. So the purpose of this amendment is beyond climate change and all that other good stuff. Let's just ensure that there are enough financial incentives for more people to look at SREX and say, boom, it's locked in. It does, it's not going up and down anymore. I'm not averse to that. I'm, you know, I'm immune from that. I want to go solar now. So 
I said a lot, but you know that's that's my argument here. Um, Tom, welcome aboard. Um, just to you know catch you up real quick, two major things that we discussed today. Number one was the co-op that we ran earlier this year. Um, it, it's actually coming to an official close on August thirty first. We just reviewed the numbers, um, but in short, it's been the best co-op in DC so far. The second best that we had was back in 2015 in Ward, I think it was in Ward 4. We had 64 signed contracts. This year we had 74 and counting. So it's been good. Number two is the Expansion Amendment Act. And we're looking for more folks to testify in favor of that. And the hearing is on October 3rd. Um, if you look at the agenda, there are more bullet points or some guide on how to testify in that. And we will be sending more material as a follow-up to this meeting. I believe tomorrow, um, Alexis, or I believe on Monday, but you know, um, that's what we've been talking about. Every, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, I think I either spoke too fast or it was, it was just two big items today, but um, any other questions folks have, or even outside this, I mean, the purpose of this meeting every month is if you have questions about your existing system or you have a friend, who has other questions, this is your chance. And for folks who are watching a recording of this, that's what we're here for. This is off co-op season now. So our peak season is from March to end of September for the co-ops. Outside of that, we're still supporting people with existing systems or people who just want to go solar on their own. So if you know friends who want to go solar, just send them our way at DC team at solarunitedneighbors.org. But Amy, you had your hand up. I, I just wanted to add that I also volunteer with a dc citizens climate lobby folks and after this meeting there's going to be a meeting to to organize a presentation on how the ira can benefit dc and um and obviously there's solar things in the ira that would benefit dc a great deal so um mm -hmm. i can keep you apprised on how that goes i don't know if this group would want to participate in any other way also somebody else with that group um suggested the possibility of going to ANC meetings to encourage people to go solar. And I said, I would mention it to you all. I don't, um, it was just a thought you had. I don't know that it's developed beyond that, but I wanted to pass that on as a, I don't know if that's something that makes sense or not, but that was a suggestion. Fair enough. I mean, it looks like you have a packed evening, but yeah, keep me briefed on how that meeting goes. And mm -hmm. if any, you know, folks have any question, follow-up questions for the IRA, um, mm -hmm. I receive tons of questions. I, I have received tons of questions in the past month from solar owners or people who were looking to go solar. But for people who are watching a recording for context, um, this was passed last month as a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. The benefits specifically to the renewable industry, specifically solar here, have to do with the tax credits, among other benefits. The big talking point was the ITCs originally were at 26% this year going down to 22% next year, and then disappearing altogether. Now, that's troublesome if your installation was not being completed by this year because you would be losing on that benefit or that potential benefit, but not anymore. After that law was passed, ITCs or solar tax credits are 30% for any installations that are potentially signed this year up until the next decade, until 2032. And I'm spacing out, but I know they drop after that, and I believe... I think they go down to 26%. I'm not 100% sure. I believe in 2032, but again, that's 10 years from now. What you have to know is they're locked in at 30% for the next decade. So a lot of people ask me, well, my installation wouldn't be done this, this year. Am I losing benefits? The answer is no. If you're you know, feeling compelled by your sales rep to go solar this year, don't be. You can still go solar next year. You're not losing anything. The only, I wouldn't say disadvantage, but what would happen is when you do file a federal tax returns, you won't go the, get those benefits next year. It will be the year after, that's all. But it will be at 30%. And assuming you have a large enough federal tax burden, that's the other big thing. Um, the other big benefit of the IRA Act was um, previously a lot of people used to install you know, battery backups or additional features of a solar system, which would not qualify for ITCs. Not anymore. You can install those standalone components such as an EV charger, a solar, ba you know, a battery backup, and they will still qualify for those ITCs. It does not have to be interconnected to a solar system. That's another big benefit. 
And these, you know, these ITCs carry over. So if you don't have a large enough federal tax burden, say in 2023, that's fine. And your remaining credit can be rolled over into the next year and you can still redeem those benefits. Those were the two big ones off the top of my head, but I do not have it in the, in the agenda. We do have an FAQ on the IRA. It's on our website. Um, I believe that's our policy associate, Emma Searson. She did a brilliant job on this and it's on the website, but I'll be happy to send it as a follow-up after this meeting and I will make a note of that. Okay, so we have covered the, the Amendment Act, IRA, co-ops. Um, it's gonna be like last month. Sorry to be a buzzkill, but it's a short meeting. Unless there are any questions, we can end early or we can, I'm happy to stay here and answer any you know, individual questions. So I'll give it say 20, 30 seconds and then we can call it a night. But It's never buzzkill to have a short meeting. No, of course exactly. not. But you know, I mean, there is that pressure because Anya is brilliant in terms of the resources she has in her head and she can always off the top of her head talk about different stuff. And, I'm still learning my trade, let's just say that, but I believe I covered everything. So, but happy to answer any questions. Um, this, is a, this is your chance. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in early. I haven't attended these meetings before, so I apologize. I don't, I don't know what subject matters are covered, but um, sure. Amy mentioned ANC meetings. I, I happen to be an ANC commissioner. Um, and I, I don't know that ANC meetings would be the best, um, Venue for getting the word out. I'm, not, I'm very surprised at how many DC residents don't know how good the, the solar incentives are in DC. Um, I would love for someone to have a couple million dollars to do an advertising blitz to make sure everybody in the city knows about it. But Gary, where I, where I as an ANC commissioner try to work on um, greening up infrastructure, there's a lot of laws that are out there um, that even developers don't know that come before an ANC. For example, the, the, you have to have a certain number of solar charge, uh, of EV charging stations now, new development that the law just passed a couple of weeks ago that um, there's not supposed to be any, any gas lines in new buildings. Um, and certainly ANCs, one of the things our ANC asks for that I, I think ANC, all ANCs could do is from applicants um, doing uh, commercial developments is asking them to put solar on the roof. Um, that's something our ANC has gotten some press. So I think there are some areas where there would be some opportunities through the ANCs to engage with ANCs to get them thinking about some of this electrification and, and going solar on stuff that comes before them. So um, uh, it, it's not the worst idea to go to ANC meetings and open forum and, and put a plug in for solar, but I, I think the more impactful thing might be getting ANCs thinking about negotiating with applicants for uh, greener buildings, including solar. So, um, and I have some experience with that. If somebody wanted to take that on, I, I could certainly share my own experience with with stuff that our ANC has has done. But I mean, I, you know, I mean, the builder we're dealing with on a project right now is not even aware of the um, fact that I think it's in 2025, no new buildings can be built with gas in them. So there's a lot of stuff out there percolating that I think there's not a, a lot of education getting out to people in neighborhoods. I'll pass that on to the person who made that suggestion. Yeah, because it's obviously much more complicated than she was thinking. Uh, well, it's not hard to go to an ANC meeting. It's just the, the bang for the buck. I mean, our, our meetings have 25, 30 people most of the time. So it's it could be a lot of time to not reach very many people. That's the renewable industry in a nutshell. I mean, folks who are actively involved in it, they know the benefits and all the incentives out there. But it's, it's the same for our, our organization. Like the number of times people who reach out to me and say, I was not aware that we could monetize that, right? So I was not aware of these benefits or is solar worthy and whatnot. And I used to live in a bubble where hey, I was hun. like, well, I well, believe someone is unmuted, but okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, I mean, our growth has been organic and we just rely on existing owners or solar owners to spread the word. I'm still trying to understand how to make our campaigns more effective in terms of advertising. So if you guys have a solution, let me know, but we are still figuring it out year after year. We're getting better, but you know, we started off in one state, now in 12 states, but we're working on it. Yeah, no, you guys are fantastic. I mean, I saw a Nextdoor post before I got kicked off a Nextdoor two weeks ago from a guy selling solar and he presented it as like an ROI schematic and what the return on investment on solar is and it was better than, it was a very effective way to argue for solar. And I mean, mm -hmm. he was trying to sell solar, but I think if 
I mean, I'm in, I'm in Upper Northwest where probably every, almost everybody up here could afford solar if they wanted to. I think if folks knew that the systems were paying off in four and a half, five years, um, you, know, you, you couldn't uh, find enough contractors to put solar on roofs up here if everybody knew that, I think. Um, I think. I think appealing to people's wallets is more effective than um, any environmental inclination that they have, so. Right. Yeah, I don't mean to digress. I mean, what's worse than people not knowing about the benefits are folks who are adversely affected by existing solar contracts. I, I'm not gonna drop any names in the chat or over here in this call, but oftentimes we have people who sign PPAs or third-party agreements with specific companies on the East Coast and uh, it starts out well. And then the prices somehow just escalate or they just jump. And um, you know we are not affiliated with them, but it's too little, too late because they did not read the fine print. And we just, you know, when I run these info sessions on the one on ones of solar, I try to remind people that, listen, I mean, solar is great. There are benefits. It's still a pricey investment. If it's too good to be true, true. And when I mean say that, I mean. If there are zero upfront costs and you're still get, you're getting all the benefits over the system's lifetime, something's amiss. Read through the fine print and just understand the whole contract. Most people who reach out, it's too late, and you know they do went out to us. We try our best to connect them to a, a relevant third party, but if, by that time they're so soured by the whole experience, they're not going to recommend anyone else for solar. So. It's also the lack of awareness, but also some negative experience people have then. Yeah, I know I went off on a tangent, but this is another challenge. And okay, um, I think that covers everything. I'm not gonna you know, keep you guys on for any longer than necessary, but thanks again for being here. As a follow-up, you will receive a link or recording to this session today. We will be giving you more resources and a follow-up email. As always, I moderate the help desk in DC. So if you have any questions, you can reach us at DC team at solarunitedneighbors.org. I usually get back in within 12, 12 hours and you know, tomorrow's a Friday, I'm in a good mood, I'll be faster. But yeah, I think that covers everything and thank you again. You all have a good night. Thanks.